Sure, government can tax your warrant. But one thing that they can never do when they have failed in their own mandate is tax a year of your life. Today's proposition has, has lost for two main reasons. Firstly, they've lost because they didn't just have to show that these students have an obligation, they had to show that they have a heightened obligation. They had to show why these specific graduates have more of an obligation than anyone else in society, why they have more of an obligation than somebody, for example, who's graduated from an FET college. They haven't done that. Secondly, assuming but not conceding that they had proven that obligation, they had to show that this specific mechanism was the most legitimate and was the most effective. They haven't done that either. That's why proposition is lost today. I'm going to be speaking about five clashes. One, individual harms. Two, obligation. Three, the illegitimacy of the mechanism. Four, the benefits to society. And five, active harms to society. So let's firstly look at individual harms. So proposition never really contested just how harmful this was to individuals. We gave you two levels of harm. Firstly, we said that it's incredibly financially harmful. For a year of these students' lives, they cannot support themselves. What this means is that they can't support themselves or often dependents who rely on them. That exacerbates problems like uh, exorbitant student loans, which then place massive burdens on these people. Secondly, we told you that there are harms of you of losing a year of your life because you're forced to do something against your will. We told you that that time is intrinsically valuable to people. We told you oh, that, that losing that time intrinsically limits your choice. So in conclusion, it's incredibly harmful to those individuals. So now let's look at the clash of obligations. So here I'll be showing you why these graduates don't have a heightened obligation to take on those personal harms, why they don't have more of, a, more of an obligation than anyone else. So Proposition tried to give you three reasons. Firstly, they said that they have an obligation because they received services from government. We have a number of responses here. Firstly, what we'd say is that everybody receives services from government. In fact, if we think back to Proposition First Speaker's speech, examples of the things that these people receive are things such as roads, things like security services. Who doesn't benefit from those two things? And what we see is that secondly, it's their right to receive this specific service of subsidization of their tertiary st studies for two reasons. One, we see that these tertiary studies are needed by society. Government has a mandate to promote economic growth in its country, and this is a necessary factor in order for them to do that. For that reason, from society's perspective, we think that government has a mandate to provide that tertiary education, which otherwise would be unaccessible. Secondly, what we see is that the students deserve it themselves. What we see is that getting into university these days isn't just because you're lucky, isn't just because you're from a wealthy background, it's because you deserve to be there. Government has a mandate to provide those services. What does that mean? It means the government hasn't gone out of their way. They haven't gone over and above the call of duty for these specific people. We don't think that those people then have more of an obligation for that reason. So, the second thing that they told us is that they have an obligation to do it because it's the moral thing to do. Two responses. One, saying that it's the moral thing to do just isn't an argument in the real world. I didn't donate to Darfur, that doesn't mean that I had an obligation to do that. Secondly, they didn't show why this obligation, even if it existed, applies more to these specific people than anyone else. The fact is that anyone in society can go and give a year of their life to community service. Anybody can be useful. Why does that apply specifically to those people? No analysis on that qualification. Thirdly, they said that there's a utilitarian justification that it benefits society and therefore we can force people to do that. Well, what we see is that basically from the fact that they ran a moral justification before that, utility isn't everything. Government simply can't justify things based on utility. If they could, we would be doing things very differently. We would be in a very different society. We gave you two levels of unresponded analysis. Firstly, we told you that there are two actors. There are poor students who deserve that service from government, who don't have that obligation to society, but rather fall on the opposite side of that obligation. Secondly, we talked to you about richer students, students whose families have contributed to tax, students who are going to contribute to tax in the future, students who have already footed enough of an obligation to society. Secondly, what we told you is that government simply had the mandate to provide those services. So in conclusion, what we can see there is that it's incredibly harmful to students, and students don't have the obligation to take that harm off. Yes, Emma? Okay, thank you for this new
you offline of why university students in all three. But secondly, we've told how you listen to our case, which is all about fostering this culture of giving back, not just from universities, and incorporating this into the education. Okay, thanks, ma'am. You're actually going to do the opposite than fostering a culture of giving back, because you create the perception that you should only give back when you're forced to do it. You create the perception that it's a chore, not something that people do. And what we see is that that is actually going to lead to other people buying out of contributing to this community service, because it's not seen as something which is voluntary, it's seen as something which is forced, which comes with very negative connotations. So thirdly, let's look at the illegitimacy of the mechanism. So here I'll be showing you why this specific mechanism, regardless of obligation, is illegitimate. So it's illegitimate on two levels. Firstly, in terms of who it targets. So proposition drew an arbitrary line in the sand between who it does and who it doesn't target. It's a specific group of people. They never gave us analysis about why it should be them specifically. Secondly, it's illegitimate in terms of what it actually takes. So let's look at normal monetary tax. What we see is that with monetary tax, it's an objectively quantifiable amount. The thing with time is that time has different values for different people. Different people have different earning potentials, so based on that arbitrary distinction, you're taking different amounts from different people. So it's illegitimate on those two levels. So let's look at this fourth clash of the supposed benefits to society. So I'll be showing you here why proposition doesn't achieve what they're trying to do, and why opposition is actually the one who benefits society in a meaningful way. So proposition told you that all graduates have the capability to help, therefore we're going to help service provision and the like. We've got four responses here. Firstly, most graduates simply aren't useful. Philosophers simply don't do much for this kind of thing. Secondly, even those who do have useful degrees aren't useful at that point in time because they're graduates, they can't do much without supervision. You need a superior to, su to supervise them, and if they're there, then why have the graduate there? No, thank you. Thirdly, what we say is that they don't have buy-in, and as a result, they wouldn't be productive even if they had the skills necessary. Four, it creates this perception that something is being done and that you should only contribute when you're forced to. That's going to lead to less people voluntarily buying into the system. Secondly, they told you that it benefits social cohesion. Well, no, it actually increases that tension. Why? Because if, if you look at the perception that, it, that it's going to create amongst the upper class, it's going to create the perception that the poor are simply leeching off them, that the poor are stealing a year of their life. That's going to increase that kind of tension. Thirdly, they said that there are massive personal benefits. Well, if there were personal benefits, why would we have to force them? Inherent in the fact that they have to force them lies the fact that it's not going to benefit these people. So now let's look at the last clash of the active harms to society. So we told you about brain drain. We told you about the disincentive to study. We told you about the lowered ability to study for longer because these people then have to support themselves for an extra year after their studies. What that means is that they're less able to, support, to, to, to commit to longer periods of study because of that additional year. Fourth, we told you that it actively harms uh, service provision because they simply add detriments, add burden to those systems. They don't actually help anything. In conclusion, ladies and gentlemen, government may be able to tax your wallet, but government cannot tax a year of your life.